Hello everybody, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So, in this video, as you can probably tell by the title, I'm going to be talking about a couple interrelated things. The general time period or process or series of events, however you want to term it, that we call the European Enlightenment uh, or the Enlightenment more broadly. This period in the mid to late, although I guess you could push it back to the early um, 18th century as well. So basically the 1700s. This era when we start getting all of these rapid, you know, intellectual, um, so not only scientific, but uh, mathematical, medicinal, political, all these different ideas developing in not necessarily just Europe, but really the Atlantic world more generally. So in the British colonies in North America, in some French colonies in North America, certainly in Europe, um, certainly in France, certainly in Great Britain, in what is today basically Germany as well, um, in Poland, certainly all of this stuff is going on. So we're going to talk about that, and I also want to talk about this wonderful stimulant my own personal drug of choice that I'm holding in this mug in my hand, and that is coffee, um, and the culture of coffee houses, the culture of coffee drinking, and the impact that that had on the Enlightenment. Now, before we get going, let me say two things before we do so. Okay, thing number one. I am doing this video strictly off the top of my head, so uh, I guess to an extent this is probably going to be more like pop, less, you know, academic history that this channel is normally used to. Uh, we might go into the bad history territory. I'm going to try not to because I'm not working from a script. Um, and the other, okay, is that you will sometimes, not, not always, but you will sometimes, if you are investigating this topic, you're going to come across these less than stellar takes on the whole thing. Um, certainly there are YouTube videos that do this, probably there are articles in, you know, newspapers, magazines, which say the same thing. Basically, there's an argument that coffee um, and the culture of drinking coffee created the Enlightenment. That is a hard no. No one single thing really drove that process. However, what makes it interesting is that coffee did actually play a huge role in the Enlightenment and how those ideas were spread, which of course is what we're talking about in this video. So to start us off, what I want to do is actually read to you uh, two paragraphs from this book, A History of the World in Six Glasses. So this is a um, popular history of the world, right, as the title suggests, and it's looking at history through uh, different drinks in different cultures of drink. So this book goes over things like beer, uh, the development of wine, tea, Coca-Cola's in here, spirits like whiskey, you know, liquor, that sort of thing, um, and certainly coffee. So about halfway through the chapter on coffee, this is uh, what Tom Standage, the guy who wrote the book, this is what he says, and it's broadly correct. He says the following, French coffee houses highlighted the paradox that despite the intellectual advances of the Enlightenment, progress in the social and political spheres had been hindered by the dead hand of the ancient regime. So this is the um, ancient regime, the old power structure of France that was overturned by the revolution in 1789 when they cut off everybody's heads. And then Robespierre gets shot in the face and the whole thing ends, but that's a different story. So. He continues by saying, The wealthy aristocracy and clergy, a mere 2% of the population, were exempt from taxes, so the burden of taxation fell on everyone else. The rural poor and the wealthier members of the bourgeoisie, who represented the aristocracy's firm grip on power and privilege. In coffee houses, the contrast between radical new ideas about how the world might be and how it actually was became most apparent. As France struggled to deal with the mounting financial crisis largely caused by its support, for America in the Revolutionary War, coffee houses became centers of revolutionary ferment. According to one eyewitness in Paris in July of 1789, coffee houses are not only crowded within, but other expectant crowds are at the doors and windows, listening open mouthed to certain orators who, from chairs or tables, harangue each his little audience. The eagerness with which they are heard, and the thunder of applause they receive for every sentiment of more than common hardiness or violence against the government, cannot be easily imagined. Now, here's the interesting part about this, okay? As the public mood darkened, a meeting of the Assembly of Notables, the clergy, aristocrats, and magistrates, 
failed to sort out the financial crisis, prompting King Louis XVI to convene the Estates General, an elected National Assembly for the first time in over 150 years. The meeting at Versailles degenerated into confusion, however, prompting the king to sack his finance minister Jacques Necker and call out the army. Ultimately, it was at the Café de Foy on the afternoon of July 12, 1789, that a young lawyer named Camille de Molines set the French Revolution in motion. Crowds had gathered in the nearby gardens of the Palais Royal, and tensions rose as the news of Necker's dismissal spread, since he was the only member of the government trusted by the people. Revolutionaries stoked fear that the army would soon descend to massacre the crowd. Demolin leapt onto a table outside the cafe, brandishing a pistol, and shouting to arm citizens to arms. His cry was taken up, and Paris swiftly descended into chaos. The Bastille was stormed by an angry mob two days later and Bastille Day is still a major national holiday in France. The French historian Jules Michelet subsequently observed that those who assembled day after day in the coffee houses saw, with penetrating glance, in the depths of their black drink, the illumination of the year of the revolution. It literally began at a cafe. Okay, so my point with reading that to you is to demonstrate that coffee does have an impact on what's going on in the 1700s, and there is a somewhat plausible argument you can make that coffee played a major role in the American and the French revolutions. But, like I said, coffee does not kickstart the Enlightenment. It doesn't, you know, set it off. But it does play a role. So what is that role? Well, to really talk about what that role is, the first thing we should probably do is um, talk briefly about this thing called the Enlightenment. So... What is that? Well, we already briefly covered that it's this period in European history, and, and you know, really not European, but um, Atlantic history more broadly, when all of these intellectual changes and all of these um, scientific innovations, political ideas, when all of this stuff was kind of bubbling to the surface of society and really altering how society functions, how it conceives itself. So there's a French school of um, historiography, the Annals School. Okay, I've talked about it before on this channel, but one of the things that that school of historiography is concerned with, because it takes a big picture approach, it tries to step back and examine history from, you know, the viewpoint of centuries, not like 50 years, 40 years. So like an Annals examination of the Second World War wouldn't just look at like 1933 to 1945, it would step back to like 1800. Um, one of the things that that school deals with is what historians who practice it call the change in mentality, okay, the um, intellectual shifts that go on in a society. So I'm bringing that up because there is this stereotype about the Enlightenment when you think about, you know, who's doing the research, who's doing the arguing, who's coming up with these political ideas. If I say Enlightenment to you, I would be willing to bet probably the majority of you, if I asked you to like list off, you know, names and, and concepts, you would probably do something like, you know, especially if you're like American, because this gets hammered um, in our public school system, you'd probably say something like Voltaire, you know, Jean Locke, uh, Montesquieu, maybe if you're of a more philosophical bent, uh, you might say Immanuel Kant, you might say Hegel, um, but you would also list off things like the scientific revolution, which preceded it, uh, maybe the Copernican model, because this was still coming into its own in this period. Um, certainly you would list off the American War of Independence, you would list off the French Revolution, um, and then if we get into politics, you'd probably say stuff like, you know, governments exist by the consent of the governed, separation of powers, constitutions, that kind of thing. That all comes from the Enlightenment. But... It's the names that you might list off, Locke, Montesquieu, etc., that's important. There is the stereotype that the Enlightenment was propagated by these um, intellectuals, by these wealthy people, these aristocrats, who had the leisure time, because they had the money, to sit and study and, you know, write all these books and read all these pamphlets, and that's not incorrect. That is a major factor in the Enlightenment, but with the rise since the, oh, I don't know, let's say since the 1960s, 1970s, with 
two new branches of historiography, social history and cultural history, which are both related. Um, they try to look at the role of the common man. Those impacts, those methodologies, have forced historians of the Enlightenment to take another look at the period and to realize that, well, if you're really going to talk about the Enlightenment, this period of intellectual stimulation, intellectual progress, if you want to conceive of it like that, it's not just the rich intellectuals who are doing all the stuff, right, that matters. Because ideas, no matter what the idea is, doesn't enter society through the conversations, through the uh, will of the intellectual. It is formed with a mass base. Ideas take their shape as they are filtered through society at large, which means if you're going to talk about the Enlightenment and you're going to do it properly, especially where coffee is concerned, you have to talk about the masses as well, which is where coffee comes into play. Okay, so on the one hand, we've got these intellectuals, Voltaire, Montesquieu, etc., right? The uh, big-name people we typically think of when we think of the Enlightenment. So that's, that's like one factor. We're going to take all those guys and we're going to put them in this little box over here, okay? But we've got these other boxes we have to fill in and talk about when we're talking about the Enlightenment. So we've got the intellectuals who are doing all the theorizing, um, and some of them are engaged in what's called natural philosophy. We would basically understand this to be like science. This is when the scientific method that we typically think of it um, was developed, and those intellectuals are playing around with all of these fancy little gadgets. This is when chemistry really begins, people are investigating um, natural phenomena, which eventually leads us to a more uh, rigorous understanding of what becomes, you know, physics. So they're playing with things like prisms, uh, flasks, test tubes, other, you know, laboratory glassware. So I don't know about things like Erlenmeyer flasks, but, you know, cer certainly um, chemical glassware. Um, they have telescopes. And those telescopes need lenses, and you need someone to build the telescope. People are using um, all of these different instruments that we employ in the modern scientific laboratory. Well, who makes those? It's not the intellectuals, it's artisans. So artisans go into another box. Engineers go into another box. Uh, these, these guys are trying to disseminate their ideas. So you need a printing press, and you need people to work the printing press. So you have publishers and writers going into another box. So my, my point is that there's multiple factors here, okay, which are all going to be interacting with each other. And they interact in coffee houses. So 1492, right? The, the famous rhyme is that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, discovered America, um, Spanish conquer Mexico and South America and a chunk of the American West. Well, what does it say, the American West? The British come over, they establish colonies. The French come over, they establish colonies. And you start the Columbian Exchange. And one of the things that goes along with that is the slave trade in the 1500s, 1600s, certainly in the early 1700s until British morality gets the better of them and they start campaigning to outlaw it, um, although that's more of like an early 19th century thing. But my, my point is that there's transatlantic trade going on. One of the things that's being traded is coffee. Now there are a couple of different ways that coffee gets to um, the Americas because it's not native to the area. And one of the ways, and I'm only really picking this because it's one of the more interesting stories, is this uh, French guy. His name is Gabriel Matthew de Clou, or, or Clou. I don't know how it's actually pronounced. Anyway, he's a French guy, and he uh, breaks into the King of France's greenhouse, and he basically, like, steals a portion of the King's coffee plant, and he smuggles it on board a ship, and he's, like, really, really protective of this. He, uh, will actually suffer dehydration because he's giving his drinking water to his plant, and then when he doesn't have water, he's, like, cutting his hand and feeding his blood to keep the thing alive. And he's really, really jealously guarding this because he knows it's valuable. That's why it was in the king's greenhouse. So he finally reaches the island of, or the French colony, uh, of Martinique, and he plants the thing, and he develops a coffee plantation, and he becomes wealthy. So this is one of the ways that what's called the Great Stimulant 
gets to the Americas. So coffee very quickly spreads and everybody starts drinking coffee. Now, part of the argument for why this drove the Enlightenment, um, which is not at all true, is that this was like a stimulant and it led people to start drinking coffee, they're not drinking beer anymore, they're not drinking wine, things that were depressants, they make you slow. Um, no. People in this period drank plenty of water, they drank plenty of juice, yeah, they drank wine, they drank beer and other alcohols, um, but we should not think of people in this time period as being, like, just perpetually, you know, lethargic because of what they drink. Um, what coffee does is, like I have mentioned a few times, it develops coffee houses. So it's in coffee houses. The, one of the first ones actually is in um, Oxford. It's for the university, okay? These become areas where all of these different people who have an impact on how and why the Enlightenment develops in the way that it does, intellectuals, artisans, engineers, printers, uh, pamphleteers, etc., all of these people meet in coffee houses because this was the fashionable, cool thing to do. It's where you went to spend your free time. And as these people sat around tables and they drank their coffee, they would be there for hours and hours and hours, and they would talk. Now, what would they talk about? Um, well, it depends on the country you're in. In England, the laws were a little more lax in terms of like freedom of speech. Um, so very quickly, coffee houses become, for the time, politically radical. Okay, it's politically radical. What are they talking about that's radical? Basically, what we would understand today to be like normal political stuff, um, consent of the governed, democracy, Suffrage to a degree, maybe, maybe not mass suffrage, like everybody could vote, uh, but certainly like male property holders could vote, those kinds of things. Trying to remove um, these absolutist monarchs, break up the power of the throne, that's what a lot of these people are talking about in coffee houses in England. And out of all of these coffee houses, probably one of the most prominent is the one in uh, Birmingham. And it's prominent because of the people who went there to drink coffee and, you know, exchange ideas. One of the groups in the Birmingham Coffee House was called the Lunu Society. So named because they would meet during a full moon because it was, you know, bright and it's safer to walk home at night. So the lunatics, as they call themselves, and I'm going to just read this to you off of Wikipedia here um, because it's a fairly concise list of who's there. So who's part of this Lunar Society. Well, we have Matthew Bolton, Erasmus Darwin, so that's um, Charles Darwin's father, Thomas Day, Richard uh, Edgewood, Samuel Galton Jr., Robert Johnston, James Keir, Jonathan Stokes, William Small, Josiah Wedgwood. So these are all big names in the um, English Enlightenment. And then the most important one for the purposes we're talking about here in this video would be um, Joseph Priestley. So there's this really good book about Priestley. Um, if I remember correctly, it's called The Invention of Air, so something like that. Priestley is the guy who discovers oxygen, okay? Um, we're not going to go into how and why he discovers oxygen in this video, but what's important is that Priestley is sometimes looked at, especially by people who study um, early American history, as one of the, like, forgotten founding fathers. So Priestley was English, um, he was a chemist, he did a lot of natural science, again, things that would eventually develop into chemistry, physics, biology. He's interested in all of that, um, and he's a political radical. He is a uh, liberal in the Enlightenment. He strongly believed in rationalism, uh, political liberalism, he believed in the free and open exchange of ideas. He tried to actually take those ideas and at least attempt to fuse them with um, Christian theology to try to make the world make sense, given what he knew. And he was an outspoken and vocal supporter of the American and the French revolutions. And eventually, um, for these reasons and, and for others, a mob in Birmingham sets his house on fire and he flees. He goes to the United States. Now, why does he go to the United States? Well, as a member of the Lunar Society, Priestley was friends with um, other intellectuals in the area, but he also kept an open and ongoing correspondence with some of the American founding fathers, specifically Benjamin Franklin. So my point with bringing up Priestley, okay, is that because he's active in the coffee house 
where Coffee House is, um, in Birmingham, England, he's part of this network of intellectuals, artists, etc., scientists, who are debating political philosophy, political theory, um, they're debating economic ideas, they're debating intellectual ideas, which is a major driver in the Enlightenment. Coffee houses matter because this is where these people went. It's not necessarily incorrect to think of this as like a coffee house internet, okay? This is where people went to learn. This is where people went to buy books. Um, this is where people went to debate politics and talk about various ideas. And it's in coffee houses that people start playing around. Well, it's not the only place, but it's, it's one of the places where people start playing around um, and learning about a major pillar, a major um, institution of our modern financial system, the stock market. So in many ways, all of the things that govern the modern world, in part, come out of coffee houses. Now in France, as far as the French Revolution is concerned, coffee houses matter for the following reason. Okay, so when you talk about the French Revolution, even more than the American Revolution, um, there is the argument, there is the belief that Enlightenment ideals really kicked off, really inspired the movement. And that's not incorrect. Um, but there are two ways of looking at this. There are two um, sides of the debate among professional historians of the French Revolution, which, by the way, if you're interested in it, you know, by all means, read about it. Just be aware that the French Revolution is one of the most historiographically active topics you can ever delve into, so it's going to so it's going to take a lot of reading. Um, but basically the debate is, well, the Enlightenment and the ideas were a factor. Uh, was it a prime driver? Or was it kind of like this general background to all of it? And when you're getting into that debate, you're going to start dealing with these things called um, salons. So salons were meeting areas, typically in like, you know, the homes of uh, aristocrats, where the people we typically think of as driving the Enlightenment, the aristocracy, the intellectuals, met and discussed science, political philosophy, etc. But this is for the bigwigs. This is for the aristocracy. In France, the coffee houses tended to be for the lower orders of society, including women. So you have these two separate areas, the two separate social spaces which are doing similar things. And because in France, unlike in England, uh, freedom of the press was much more restricted, you don't really get the open dissemination of like accurate news in French coffee houses. What you get instead is, you know, yeah, to a, to a degree you get news, um, but you often get these, you know, bulletin boards uh, which have these handwritten notes, sometimes they're uh, printed, and you get people reading this stuff and they're talking about what's being read. Okay, well, so what, what are they reading? What are they talking about? Uh, and the answer is basically um, conspiracy theories. There are tons of sources from this period, from these coffee houses of, you know, documents which say, oh, the French took such and such a mistress, um, or this person in the king's court is doing this or that, and it leads to um, fear among the French population that there may potentially be more restrictive laws enacted, there may be um, higher rates of taxation, etc. Maybe there's fears that, you know, the kingdom's going to enter another war. Well, you just got out of the American War of Independence, that's maybe not going to be a good idea. Is any of this real? No, not really, but it gets the gears turning in people's minds, and it freaks them out. So this was a major factor in igniting the French Revolution. And it comes from coffee houses. So the general point of this video is that coffee houses become the areas, um, the, the environments, the spaces in which the Enlightenment ideals and news and political discussions were disseminated through. It's what they come out of. And it's through coffee houses that you get all the different sectors of society meeting for hours on end. Like I said, it's kind of like a coffee house internet. And this is why they matter for the Enlightenment and for the study of things like the French Revolution and, you know, modern science. Because this is what people did in their spare time. So if you want to understand things like the French Revolution or the Enlightenment or the history of science, you have to understand the cultural impact of coffee, coffee houses, and the culture of drink. So guys, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. 
Take care and I will see you all next time.